Hello and welcome again to my physics online video lecture supplement series. Today's video we're going to be looking at the uh, optics as a topic. So this set of lectures will be the introduction to optics lecture set. And um, as an overview before we get into what we're doing today specifically, uh, what we want to do is get a brief, maybe two lecture part, three lecture part um, study of optics. So it's really more of an introduction and not meant as a comprehensive course. Uh, I may be offering a comprehensive course on that in the future online and certainly I teach one on campus already. So what is optics concerned with? Well it's basically concerned with light. Um, specifically, it's usually concerned with visible light, although I guess you could make the argument that anything in the electromagnetic spectrum is of some interest to optics. And we're going to be looking at, or you could look at, both the classical and quantum properties of light. And this includes properties of light as a wave, properties of light as a particle, how light propagates, what are the laws that govern the behavior of light, etc. And what I'm interested in doing in this introduction to optics is basically looking at predominantly stuff that would be called classical optics and looking at a few properties. Uh, on the one hand, geometric properties of light, which include the laws of reflection and of refraction, and basically how images get formed from ref um, via reflection and via refraction, or in other words, uh, for our purposes, by using a mirror or using a lens. And then also, we can look at some of the more wave-like properties, which includes the fact that light diffracts, and the fact that light waves can interfere with each other. So today I want to do part one, which is the geometric optics. And what we're going to do is basically look at two laws that govern geometric optics, namely the law of reflection and also Snell's law of refraction. And then we're going to sort of apply those two laws by finding images from a lens and finding images from a mirror. So to get started, the law of reflection actually has two parts. And those two parts say, on the one hand, that the incident ray, the refracted ray, and the perpendicular surface line which are basically shown in this diagram here, incident ray, reflected ray, line that's perpendicular to the surface, uh, must all lie within the same plane. So that's the first part of the law of reflection. So this line, this line, and this line are all within a single plane. This right here represents the surface that light is incident upon and then reflected from. The second part of the law, and the part that's written here mathematically, is that the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are actually equal. Both of these angles are measured with respect to this dashed line that's perpendicular to the surface. So you have an incident ray, and it makes some angle theta i with respect to this perpendicular to surface line. You have a reflected ray, which makes an angle theta r with respect to the same line. And these two angles, theta i and theta r, are equal. And it turns out that this law is something that we actually can observe for simple particles as well. And we observe it any time that there is, say, a collision between a ball and a wall. Or a, a perfectly elastic particle would be better still and a wall. And in fact, there's a simulation that I ran uh, back during the first semester of physics, doing the mechanics stuff, in which I 
use one of the Colorado FET simulations and do 2D collisions and allow a ball to bounce off of a wall. And what you see is that the angle that the ball is incident on the wall and the angle at which it's reflected are equal. So in case you've forgotten it, here is basically that simulation from the Colorado FETs. And basically what we do is we uh, pick the advanced version and what we do is have a, a reflecting border. And in fact, we really only need one ball to show what we want to show. And what I'll do is I'll slow the simulation down a little bit. You can watch the ball, it'll bounce off of this wall and the angle of incidence and angle of reflection will be basically the same. So there it hits and it has left the wall and if you were to draw a dashed line between where it incident and where it was uh, exiting you'd find that the incident and exiting angles are equal. And so with that set, this law of reflection is also true for photons. And indeed, given that a photon has some particle-like properties as found in uh, quantum mechanics, perhaps we should say it's therefore true for photons. Now with that said, uh, there's two broad types of reflection. One is specular, the other is diffuse. And what I'll say about that is that microscopically, a given ray, which represents the path that a, a wave front maybe travels along, so a given ray, is going to follow the law of reflection on a microscopic scale. So microscopically, you might have a material that is very rough like this. And so initially you have a bunch of rays that are coming along parallel to each other incident on the surface. They hit the surface and at each point where they hit, that individual ray is obeying the law of reflection. But on a macroscopic scale, in other words taking this collection of rays together, it seems as if the rays are scattering in completely random directions or reflecting in completely random directions. And what the result of that is, is that you get some diffuse reflection from all of your uh, photons that are incident upon a given object. And so specular reflection basically is reflection that takes place when you have light incident on a smooth surface, like a mirror. And what happens is that light tends to reflect more or less uniformly. Again, on a microscopic scale, there will be some roughness, therefore you will get some random scattering. Diffuse reflection, we usually refer to this as reflection in seemingly random directions from a rough surface. And again, microscopically, all reflections end up being um, kind of both. They all are specular if you consider only one ray. They're all diffuse if you consider a collection of rays. Macroscopically, you get a specular reflection if you have a smooth surface like a mirror. Uh, if you were to take a sort of spotlight or even a laser and shine it on a mirror, what you'd see is that if you look along most directions, you don't really see the laser beam as a bright spot. Oh, you can see that there's a little spot on the mirror, but it won't look particularly brightly. Then at some particular angle, you'll look along it and you'll see a very bright light, uh, as if you're looking directly at the spotlight or directly at the laser. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't recommend trying this with a laser because you might kind of damage your vision doing that. Uh, another example of this is, for those of you who wear watches, you may have been sitting in class one day and there's bright light coming in through the window and if you hold your hand in a particular way you can get the light to reflect off of that watch um, to make a sort of bright spot somewhere on the ceiling or if you're feeling a little more um, like being a trickster then you might rotate your hand so that it shines into somebody's face and that's basically specular reflection in action. 
diffuse reflection, you can go back to that laser shining in the mirror. If you stand somewhere else in the room and you look at the mirror, what you'll see is that, yes, there is a spot where the laser is visible on the mirror, but it might look like a simple red dot. Not particularly bright, not particularly dangerous to look directly at. And no matter where in the room you stand, as long as you're not standing directly along the uh, specular path, you can still see that red spot. So those are the two broad types of reflection. Now with that said, we're going to consider stuff in a more idealized case in which surfaces are flat. Uh, so we're going to be doing more specular reflection than diffuse reflection in this brief intro. Now the other thing that I said I was going to talk about in today's lecture is what's called refraction. And what refraction is, is the bending of light as it goes from one medium to another. And what this does is it can uh, cause a number of things. One is that if you have an object which is partially immersed in some medium like water, then the object might appear to be bent uh, where it crosses from water into air. Another thing is shown here in this picture there's actually one fish present, but you're looking from just the right angle and you might see more than one fish. Maybe you see these two fishes and you don't even see the fish where it actually is. So this is also something that is caused by refraction. So what is it that causes refraction anyway? Well, uh, light does not have a constant speed from one medium to another. And so water, for example, allows light to travel at a different speed than air, which is at a slightly different speed than vacuum, and so on. And one way that you can measure the speed at which light travels through some medium is to use what's called the refractive index. So most textbooks will give the refractive index as a lowercase n. Some will give it as a lowercase eta. I actually use a lowercase eta um, because in the past I've worked in plasma physics and lowercase n is often used to represent density. So that little statement on notation aside, the way that you represent a refractive index or what a refractive index is, is it's a measure of the ratio of how fast speed would be in vacuum divided by how fast speed is in the medium. Um, another little aside there, by the way, this definition doesn't really hold true in plasma physics. This is not the correct ratio in plasma physics to find the refractive index. But for most media that you'd actually use, like a glass or water or vacuum, etc., air, this is the ratio you'd use. And speaking of vacuum, if this is the ratio of the speed of light in vacuum to the speed in the medium, you can see that if the medium in question is vacuum, then the refractive index must be equal to exactly one. For all other media that are not called plasma, this refractive index tends to be larger than one. Turns out that in a plasma, it's smaller than one, but that's a story for another day. The speed of light itself in vacuum has actually an exact value. This is the exact value. So it is 299,792,458 meters per second. Now, this refractive index is not constant even for a given medium. It can depend on any number of factors from the wavelength of the light to the intensity of the light to the polarization of the light. Um, etc. But what we're going to do in this brief introduction is treat it as if it is in fact a constant. So what does that all have to do with uh, why light bends? Well, the reason why light bends is because you have light that is incident from some medium in which it can travel let's say quickly, onto another medium where it travels more slowly, as in this diagram. So 
your light is incident from this medium to this medium at the point at which it crosses, at the interface in other words, from air to glass, what happens is the light suddenly slows down. But the wave front, remember that light might be traveling as a, as a wave, in which case you should be drawing many, many, many of these lines to represent it, many rays. The wave front tries to sort of stay together. And so what happens is that the wave front ends up bending. And the, the rate at which that, or the, the uh, amount of bending that happens is governed by what's called Snell's Law. And uh, one way of looking at this is to use a thing called Fermat's Principle, which incidentally also predicts the law of reflection. Uh, Fermat's Principle says that if light is going to travel from point A to point B, A and B, uh, then it's going to do so along the path which takes the least amount of time to get from A to B. So if light in fact is going to go from A to B, there is a particular path that it must follow to do that. And that path minimizes the amount of time that this takes. So uh, one analogy is to imagine that instead of looking at light, you have, say, a lifeguard. And the lifeguard can see a person who's out drowning in the waves. And they've got to get to that person by running across sand and then swimming through water. And they run it across the sand at one speed, they swim across the water at another speed, and they're trying to get from this point in the sand to this point in the water in the least amount of time to save the person who's drowning. So what path would they take? And it turns out that the path that gets taken is governed by what's called Snell's Law. And so that means that the refractive index of the air times the sine of this angle in air should be equal to the refractive index in glass times the sine of this angle in glass. So that's what Snell's law is, is getting at. And it turns out that a pair of rays that obeys Snell's law is also the pair of rays which um, keeps the wave front more or less intact. And it's also the pair of rays which will minimize the time to get from point A to point B. Note that I'm not trying to claim here that every ray that originates at point A will end at point B. In fact, the only one that should end up at point B and originate at point A is this pair that's drawn here that minimizes the time to get from A to B. So let's do a few very quick examples of this. Um, so first of all, you have light incident from air onto water at an angle of 15 degrees. And we want to know what's the angle between the incident and the reflected rays. So according to the law of reflection, if your incident angle is 15 degrees, then your reflected angle should also be 15 degrees. Okay, second example, you're given an index of refraction for air. Turns out that it's reasonably close to the, to the index of refraction for vacuum. I, if I took it out to a few more decimals, then you'd get some non-zeros for air. But we'll take it as 1.000. And in water, you have 1.333 as the refractive index. And so the question is, if you are incident from air to water at 15 degrees, what's the angle of refraction going to be? And while we're at it, we'll also try to answer this question, what speed does this light travel through water at? So here basically is a little diagram of what's actually going on in this problem. So according to Snell's law, we should be able to write that the refractive index in air times the angle, uh, excuse me, times the sine of the angle in air um, is going to be equal to the refractive index in water times the sine of the angle in water. So I labeled these one and two. Uh, I guess you could just as easily label them as air and water, since we know that that's the two refractive indices uh, that we're dealing with. So what we would do here is basically we're trying to solve for this one. So you can see that sine 
of theta in water is this ratio of refractive indices for air and water times the sine of the angle in air. All right, so at this point, we can plug in numbers here. What you get is 1.00 over 1.333 times the sine of this 15.0 degrees. So that gives something like uh, 0 0.1942. Now that's the sine of the angle. What we really want is the angle itself. So theta in water becomes the sine inverse of this ratio of refractive indices in water and air times sine of angle in air. And so that is the inverse sine of this number that we just came up with here, the 0.1942. So what that gives you then um, uh, as a uh, total angle is, assuming that you've plugged everything in correctly, about 11.2 degrees. So this should be 11.2 degrees. So I've actually even drawn this about right, 15 degrees, 11.2 degrees. In other words, this should have been closer to the normal line. The other part of this example was that it asks how fast uh, light is going to travel through water. So to do that, uh, we use the fact that in general, the refractive index is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in a medium. So if you have water as the medium, then this is what the equation looks like. So the implication is that the speed of light in water is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index in water. So recall that the speed of light in vacuum was 2.9979458 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Recall that the uh, refractive index in water was given as 1.333. Three, and what you end up getting is that the speed of light in water is approximately 2.249 and then some zeros but we have only four significant figures to work with so we'll stop here uh, and then times 10 to the 8 meters per second so in other words 224 million nine hundred thousand meters per second is the approximate speed of light in water. So those are the two main principles that we're going to use today. Um, now let's look at how we can find uh, the image location and maybe some properties of the image given a mirror or given a lens or so on. So this one simple way of doing this, of, of of describing an image is to draw what's called a ray diagram. So this right here shows a sort of ray diagram in which you have a plane mirror, in other words a flat mirror, and a little object, a um, bottle, and you're trying to find where the image of the bottle is going to be formed. So you pick two representative points on the bottle. You could pick more if you'd like, and you draw at least two rays from each one of those two points. And you draw them so that they are not quite parallel and so that they originate at each of these points and hit the mirror. And then they have to obey the law of reflection from the mirror. And then what you find is that these end up sort of intersecting an eye somewhere. And it may be that you end up having to draw a very large eye to find where the intersection is. What you do then is you sort of trace along those lines that are intersecting the viewer. And you find where they actually um, end up crossing as you are. So these two came from this point and 
in order to cross you actually have to draw what's called virtual lines in the back of the mirror and these two came from the bottom and again in order to find where they cross you draw virtual lines in the mirror so you're basically just continuing this line and you're basically just continuing this line and you find that they cross here and similarly with these two lines you would continue this line you'd continue this line they cross here and so that's where the image of the bottom and top of the bottle are so then you could measure how far away this is from the mirror if you've drawn everything to scale and basically you find where the image is and how big it is and whether it's upright or inverted and so on and there are basically two types of images as labeled here uh, one is that you get a real image and the other is that you get a virtual image so in this case we have a virtual image the actual rays of light are these solid lines that's where they really do pass and you see that they do not cross other than at their originating point anywhere so you have to draw some dashed virtual lines where rays don't actually cross but where they might appear to uh, pass if you look along these rays so that means you get a virtual image because you have virtual rays to make that image there's a second type of image which is a real image in which if you had some sort of curved mirror or a lens etc the rays may end up uh, actually crossing some other place and that's where the image ends up really being formed so you get a real image so there are a variety of rules that you can use to draw your ray diagrams here's a few basic rules the first is that it's generally a good idea to use at least two originating from a given point on the object sometimes three or four is useful as well and certainly if you're able to draw three or four those will act the third and fourth will act as sort of um, double checks they also can show things like whether the image is actually sharply formed or not uh, this, the uh, point that you originate the, the uh, rays on is actually a point source so the rays have to actually spread out from that point they can't just be drawn parallel to each other and then these rays have to obey both the law of reflection and the law of refraction as appropriate and they should be geometrically correct which means if you want to find the image location exactly then you should be using a ruler and protractor to do this although sometimes it's nicer to find the approximate location and then uh, use math to calculate the actual location um, so diagram is to scale if you want to find the actual location and size of the image so the first thing that we've done is already look at images formed in a flat mirror so what about non-flat mirrors well it depends upon the geometry but the simplest geometry to work with is a, a spherical mirror and so a spherical mirror means you've taken a sphere of mirrored glass and you slice the end off of it so that you have a sort of slice of sphere which looked at from the side might look like this and there are a variety of points and lengths of interest so in most diagrams like this you might call point O the point at which the object is located or more specifically you might draw what's called the principal axis which runs through the center of the sphere and also runs through the focal point of the sphere and point O is the point on that line where you might locate the bottom of the object um, or you could call line O the line or ray along which the object is located point I is for the image and it's other than that it's the same as point O it's just that you're looking at the image rather than the object the principal axis again runs through point C which is the center of the sphere point F which is the focal point 
which is actually not shown here, will actually be halfway between center and vertex, which is point V. The primary lengths of interest are the distance between the object base and the vertex, the distance between the image and the vertex, and then the radius of curvature for the mirror. In addition, you could also find the focal length, which is always half the radius of the mirror for a spherical mirror. And there is also some interest in the heights of the image and the object, although we'll get into that a little later. So what rays would you want to draw to locate the image for a spherical uh, mirror? Well, this diagram actually shows them for both the concave and also a convex mirror. Basically, you see three of the four. Um, the first one is that you want a ray running parallel to the principal axis. So that's ray number one here, that's ray number one here, and that's ray number one here. That mirror will deflect so that it either really, or in some cases virtually, passes through the focal point. So if it is a convex mirror, the reflection goes off like this, and if you extend the dashed line, you find that it goes through the focal point. In the real case, it really passes through the focal point upon reflection. Second one is drawn so that it really or virtually passes through the focal point. Um, that one is going to reflect parallel to the principal axis. So that one is shown right here as the purple line. So it starts here, passes through the focal point, reflects, and now it's parallel to the principal axis. Here's your object. Starts off going this way because a dashed line going from focal point to the top of the object uh, would continue as this purple ray reflects, and now it's parallel again to the principal axis. And then finally, uh, number three, you can have it pass really or virtually through the center. So it passes through the center, hits the mirror. If it passes through the center, then it will intersect the mirror in such a way that it is parallel to the, the uh, uh, surface line at that point. In other words, it will retroreflect. The incident and reflected angles are both zero degrees. And wherever those three rays cross, that's where the image is formed. You can draw a fourth one, by the way, that hits the mirror right where the vertex is, and that one will reflect away so that you have equal angles between incident ray and vertex and reflected ray and vertex. That one's not really shown, but you would find that it also passes through this same point. So if you'd prefer to use algebra instead of geometry, what happens is you use what's called the mirror equation or the spherical mirror equation. This works actually for most mirrors in general. What this does is it relates distances between object and vertex, between image and vertex, and uh, between focal point and vertex. Focal point again is not shown, but it's half of the radius. And the equation looks like this, 1 over DO plus 1 over DI equals 1 over F, which is, since F is half of the radius R, this is equal to 2 over R. You can obtain this geometrically, and it turns out that it requires a small angle approximation, but I'm not going to do that derivation today. Instead, I'm going to do a couple of short examples. So what is the focal length of a mirror whose radius of curvature is 4 meters? Well, the focal length is half the radius of curvature, assuming that you have a spherical mirror. So if your radius of curvature is 4 meters, that means that the mirror was cut from a sphere that was 4 meters in radius. And this means that the focal length is 2 meters. So now the question that follows that is, you have a man who's using this mirror, 
whose radius of curvature is 4 meters, and he's standing a meter away from it. And so the question is, where is his image going to be formed? So we can first do this qualitatively. Um, I've drawn up basically the man, a large mirror, and the focal point and radius point. So first of all, we would draw the line that starts on the man and goes parallel to our principal axis. That line should reflect so that it passes through the focal point. Second, we can draw a line that uh, passes or starts on the focal point and passes through the man. And that should then uh, reflect off of the mirror in such a way that it is now parallel to the principal axis. So that line basically should reflect like this. Okay, third line that we want to draw is the line that uh, is going to be beginning at the center of the circle and passing through the man's head. So the line basically looks like this gray one and that one just retro reflects. And we can see that you can see that if you were to try and place an eyeball out here looking along these lines that they wouldn't really intersect anywhere where you can actually physically place the eyeball. So the eyeball basically has to end up looking along these lines to try and find where the uh, lines would intersect virtually. So we can basically draw a continuation of each of these lines. So I've just continued this gray line. Now I need to continue the green line. And uh, last but not least, I should continue this red line. And where these all meet is where the image of the guy would be formed. So unfortunately, it's not very easy to uh, draw on the setup that I have, but this is what the image of this guy might look like. And so if I had a ruler and protractor and the ability to draw things to scale with this setup, I would then measure out this distance and I would measure um, uh, basically how far um, from the mirror this was. I'd measure out how tall it is, and so on and so forth. Using math, we can write 1 over DO plus 1 over DI is equal to 1 over F. Or in other words, 1 over DI is equal to 1 over F minus 1 over DO. So 1 over the image distance is 1 over 2.00 meters minus 1 over 1.00 meters, or in other words, negative 1 over 2.00 meters. And so this is telling me that di should be equal to something like negative 2.00 meters. So this image should actually be formed somewhere over here if I drew everything really to scale. And um, basically twice as far away as where the original object was. So th even this drawing that's not so great still showed me the right side of the mirror for this to be formed on. Basically a, an image that is negative will form over here, an image that is positive will form over here and be real. So even the worst diagram gets you that much information as long as you haven't uh, misdrawn a line too grotesquely. All right, so now uh, I want to turn from mirrors to lenses. And basically, the image that's being formed by a mirror, uh, by a lens, excuse me, is found using one of the following rays. Um, you can use a ray that's parallel to the principal axis, and that one will refract so that it passes through the focal point. You can draw a ray that really or virtually passes through the focal point. So 
Uh, any lens has two focal points. They're equidistant from the lens, one appearing on each side of the lens. So we draw a ray going through the focal point, and that one's going to refract so that it's parallel to the principal axis. And then as a double check, you can draw a ray so that it really passes through the vertex or, or what might be called the vertex, basically the center of the lens. Um, and that one does not bend as it refracts. And so those three should meet at a common location and that's where the image will be. So in order to use a little bit of math uh, to solve this algebraically, we need a different uh, diagram. And that is this diagram. And basically you have what's called the lens maker's equation, which says that the refractive index of the me media outside of the lens uh, divided by the focal length of the lens should be the difference in refractive index between outside and inside the lens times one over the radii of curvature of these two uh, surfaces. So one over the first radius of curvature minus one over the second radius of curvature. And if you have a thin lens, this means that the thickness is much less than either the image and also the object locations. In other words, if you have a thick lens as shown here, then DI1, or the image formed by this surface, and the location of the object with respect to this surface are pretty radically different. They are different by a factor of um, basically di1 plus t equals do2. And so if this is a large number, then this equation becomes not very valid. So we're going to concern ourselves mostly with thin lenses. And if you have such a thin lens, then you can use the thin lens equation, which happily looks very much like the spherical mirror equation that we just used. And what it does is when doing image formation through a lens in general, what actually happens is each surface of the lens acts as an element that forms its own image. And so the actual, the, the DI that you're finding in the thin lens equation, um, this di and this do really represent do1 and di2. So di2 ends up being the, the distance from this surface to wherever the final image for the whole lens ends up being formed. Well, if it's a thin lens, then we can ignore that there are two surfaces and the whole thing kind of um, simplifies to just this equation. Okay, so with that said, um, both mirrors and lenses can actually magnify the size of an image relative to the object size. So here you see it in a mirror this woman is looking in a curved mirror that makes her face look bigger than it actually is. I suppose that's mostly so you can see little uh, imperfections or if you're trying to put on makeup or shave or whatever it lets you see um, spots you've missed a little better. And the lateral magnification is defined as the ratio of the image height to the object height and it can be calculated for both lenses and for mirrors by using negative of di over do. So in other words on the example that I worked a little earlier um, this gives a, uh, a basic lateral magnification of negative of negative 2 or in other words, positive two, and that means that you should have an upright image. So if the, if the magnification is positive, then the image will be upright. If the magnification is negative, then the image will be inverted. That's true for both mirrors and lenses. Let's just do a couple more examples. So you have 
a focal length in air for a biconvex thin lens whose radii are both 40 centimeters and whose refractive index is 1.48. Um, and a biconvex lens basically means a lens that looks like the, the lens drawn here. The sides bulge outward. Concave means the sides will bulge inward. Biconvex means both sides do it. If only one side does it, then it's called plano convex or plano concave. So we want to know what the focal length is going to be in um, air. So we've been told that the uh, radius 1 and radius 2 are both 40.0 centimeters. And we're told that the uh, eta 2 or eta of the glass is 1.48. We know that for air it's 1.00. So the equation that we're wanting to use then is that lens maker's equation, which says that eta 1 over f is equal to difference between eta 2 and eta 1 times 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2. Uh, excuse me, 1 uh, minus, uh, 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2, not plus. So, uh, what does this lens actually look like? Well, you have something like this. And so you notice that if, for example, you pick the center to be over here, that this one has a, uh, would have a negative, and this one right here would have a positive radius. And so if your object is over here and traveling this way, you'd eff effectively have a positive minus a negative. Or similarly, if you pick your object to start over here, then this one right here has positive, this one right here has negative, and again, you'd be subtracting the two from each other. Uh, so, in other words, the, the numbers to plug in here are 1.00 over f, is 1.48 minus 1.00 times 1 over 40 centimeters minus 1 over negative 40 centimeters. Okay, so this ends up saying that 1 over f is 0 0.48 times 2 over 40.0 centimeters. And so what that ends up giving is a focal length of about uh, 41.67, um, or 41.6 repeating centimeters uh, for the focal length. Now, what if this was placed in water instead of air, as per the second example? Well then what changes is that this number becomes a 1.33 because that's what you have for water. This number also becomes a 1.33. And so your 1 over f looks like instead of 0.48, you'd have 0.15, and this is 1.33. And so the rest of the numbers actually stay the same. And what you'd end up getting is that F is approximately equal uh, 177 centimeters. So the focal length of the same lens, if placed under water instead of being placed in the air, becomes 177 instead of 41.7. All right, so what happens if you have an object that's placed 45 centimeters from a plano concave lens of focal length minus 15 centimeters? And the basic question is, describe the image. Where is it? How big is it? Etc. So we do 1 over DO plus 1 over DI is equal to 1 over F. Or in other words, 1 over DI is equal to 1 over F minus 1 over DO. And so you have 1 over 
uh, negative 15 centimeters minus 1 over 45 centimeters. And so this basically, we could change this into a 3 over negative 45. And so you end up with negative 4 over 45 centimeters. And so di is equal to uh, negative 45 centimeters over 4 or in other words, 11.25 centimeters uh, negative. So that's where the image will actually be located. Now the magnification is negative di over do. So that's negative of 11.3 divided by 45. And so what you end up getting for your magnification is just a little over a quarter, so 0 0.251. It's a ratio, so all of the units will cancel out. So this is a unitless quantity. It's positive, so that means that this is upright. And the fact that this distance is negative means that basically the image is being formed somewhere over here. So here's where your image is. It should be a little over a quarter as tall as the initial object. So what happens if you have more than one optical element? Well, the basic answer is that you take the object and you treat it as the object for the first element, and then that element makes an image, which you then treat as if it is the object for the second element, which then forms an image, which becomes the object for the third element, if necessary, and so on. And so if you have two uh, objects, then you might write DO2 is the distance between the two objects minus DI1. And you just keep repeating that with each new element that you add until you have the final image. So that's all that we've got time for in today's lecture set. Hope that you found this uh, helpful. Uh, there are a few reading sources listed here in the references if you want to read more about this. Um, some of these, of course, are the OpenStax uh, sources that you can go get uh, for free and read. Um, and in fact, I drew from both the OpenStax College Physics and the OpenStax um, University Physics, uh, along with a few other textbooks that are referenced here. So go check those out and hope that you found this video helpful and thanks for watching.